we're just going to do a brief review um, on mechanical circulatory support devices and their implications with therapy, not just physical therapy, but occupational therapy also. Um, you see the objectives right there. Um, and just mechanical circulatory support, you'll hear, hear people talk about the MCS team. That's the MCS team. Um, and all the devices that the MCS team kind of covers are the balloon pump, all of our VADs, our ventricular assisted devices, and our VADs include impellas, LVADs, RVADs, BIVADs, um, extracorporeal CPR, which be, would be ECMO being used as a CPR device, ECMO in general, um, and then the big things are the Berlin Heart and our new total artificial heart. So all of these devices, um, most of them can either be temporary or they can be permanent. Um, the temporary devices are bridge to recovery, which hopefully with a lot of our respiratory patients, it's going to be the ECMO that um, after ARDS, you're going to just help support the heart and or lungs um, while they're recovering. And then hopefully the patient can be weaned off of the devices. Bridge to long-term device would be some, someone who comes in with cardiogenic shock. They have to be put on ECMO, on a balloon pump. Um, or on a VAD and then they recover um, or they recover well enough that they can then be put onto a VAD. Um, and of course bridge to heart or lung transplant, usually those patients, they stay here in the hospital if they're, they're on ECMO. Hopefully our VAD patients and then maybe even our total artificial heart patients can leave the hospital and go home while they wait for transplant. Um, sometimes it's a bridge to palliative care and decision, so it may be those people that they they have an incident, they come in, they're not really sure if they're recoverable or not, or maybe they can wake them up enough so the patient can say what they want to do, or they can give the family a little bit of time to come to terms with what's going on. Um, so then that happens. And sometimes we have our bridge to nowhere, which would be the patients that initially they put them on, they think they can recover, but then over a course of time, weeks, months, um, determine that they're not going to be able to lead off the device, and eventually palliative care has to become involved. Unfortunately, usually it's longer, younger people, it's people who are 100% cognitively intact, and it's just a tough decision for the family and the teens. And then, as far as long-term placement, a lot of our VADs are bridge to destination, which may mean that they don't want a transplant, they're not a transplant candidate, um, and so they're going to go home and live the rest of their life with their device. So we'll start with the balloon pump. Um, the balloon pump is one of the most common MCS devices. Um, it's usually inserted in an artery and goes up to the heart. It sits in the left ventricle and it's a balloon. The balloon will inflate during diastole and deflate with systole and it helps to push blood to the heart by sucking blood up into the aorta and the blood then goes to the rest of the body. Um, it helps with perfusion and it helps the coronary arteries actually get blood themselves. Um, those are all of the indications. Most commonly, we see it failure to wean from cardiopulmonary bypass, um, or if someone is in the cath lab having a stent placed and they code in the cath lab, then they may have the balloon pump placed. That's most common how we see it. Um, implications if it's femoral, um, the patients are going to be on strict bed rest as far as not being able to get up and do therapy at the edge of the bed or out of bed. Um, we're going to limit range of motion, no hip motion, so you're pretty much going to limit your knee motion too on the ipsilateral side. But there's no restrictions for upper extremities, no restrictions for the contralateral lower extremity. Um, we have some of these patients sometimes that do have an open chest. If they're awake and can follow commands, you can still do active range of motion, active assist range of motion, passive range of motion with these patients. You're just going to be careful with their shoulders um, as far as sometimes that causes a little bit of discomfort. Um, with the open chest. Sometimes, we haven't done it here at UK yet, but there are um, axillary cannulas, um, axillary placement of the balloon pump. And of course that's going to be good because it's going to allow for out of bed activity quicker. It's going to help um, allow us to prevent ICU weakness and myopathy and those sorts of things. It's really underutilized in a lot of ICUs, not just UKs. Um, but I put it on here just because we have had a couple of patients that they have thrown the idea around um, as far as a bridge transplant sort of thing. So that's the big thing. Um, you, if it's axillary, you would limit range of motion on the side, um, whether it's right or left. Um, the main thing is you're going to want to make sure that you monitor blood pressure, heart rate, and any signs of intolerance otherwise. 
Um, the VAD is probably the next biggest thing that we see a lot of here as far as a lot of our patients being bridged to transplant. Um, we have temporary VADs, which could be the Impella, or the VADs that we most often see here as far as bridge to transplant are the HeartMate 2, the HeartMate 3, and the HeartWare. Um, the HeartWare device can have, the patient has to be listed as bridge to transplant, but both the HeartMate 2 and the HeartMate 3 can be bridge to destination or they can be um, bridge to transplant. And again, what it's going to do, a patient has a low ejection fraction and it's going to help the native heart to pump blood. So like we said, the Impella is temporary. Typically it's less than six hours. We have had some people have um, Impellas for up to a week. Um, usually people have a, a better outcome if less than one liter per minute of cardiac output has to be supported. Um, and what it does, again, it directs your blood, just like the balloon pump, from the left ventricle into the aorta. Um, there are some trials with it being a subclavian or axillary approach or even a mini sternotomy, but for the most part, it's a femoral um, access, femoral approach, and again, um, the mobility is going to be limited with those patients. So then we get to our LVADs, which are what most of us think of when we think of an MCS device. Um, the picture you have here is a HeartMate 2, um, or it could be a HeartMate 3. Um, but the parts to consider that we have are the drive line, and we'll have a better picture in a minute, the controller, the batteries, and a variety of accessories. So when you come to the bad here, you will see, you see the controller is the white piece that's hanging on the gentleman's um, belt. There is a line that's sort of exiting here and going up into the heart. That's the drive line. It's really important that we keep the drive line intact and secure because otherwise, um, if patients, if it's pooling, then it can cause this, use the wound around here to sort of burrow in and out and cause, cause a bigger wound and it won't heal. That's a, a, a risk of infection. And a lot of our rehospitalizations with our bad patients are because of infection, drive line infection. And it can actually burrow deep and get into the pump pocket and then they have to have a pump exchange and it can be really bad news. Um, this is the pump and what happens, the pump, there is an inflow track that goes up into the ventricle. There is um, the pump speed, there's a rotor inside the pump, it spins and it sucks the blood from the ventricle, directs it up to the aorta and then it goes out to the rest of the body. There is some <laughs> native heart function, so say if somebody's ejection fraction is 15%, then approximately 15% of the body is being ejected by the heart and the rest of the blood is going to be ejected by the VAD. So you have the VAD, you have the controller. Um, if there is a problem with the controller, then there are alarms and usually most of our VADs, it warns you with words, it warns you with alarms and it tells you what to do. Most of the time, it's called the MCS coordinator or the nurse or the doctor. Um, that drive line, the drive line is kind of the brains too. So in your drive line there's five or six cords that go to the pump and basically those cords are, are the brains that are telling the pump to work. So if that drive line gets injured also or they will call it fractured then the pump can sometimes start, stop working too. So again more important uh, that we're being sure to secure the VAD always and uh, the OTs are going to talk to you about the, teaching the patients not to use scissors whenever they change their driveline dressing. We've had people do that. Um, the battery, all of our bags, there are two power sources. So most of the time with the HeartMate 2 and the HeartMate 3, people are <laughs> attached when we first come in after surgery. They're attached to the wall with two power sources to get up and move and to get out into the hallway or when they get home to go out into the community, they're going to be switched to battery. The hardware device usually has um, one battery and then one wall power source and then you will work on switching the patients, teaching the patients to switch to the other battery. So again, just another visual as to, far, as to how the HeartMate 2 works and what it looks like. And then this is a HeartMate 2 on a patient. Um, you see his, his pouch, um, his bag, and with the bag, the controller is placed in that pocket, and then both of the batteries go in the other two pockets behind there. The little red, red tab, um, the drive line, and the drive line will exit that tab, and it makes sure that the zipper can't get caught on the wires there. Um, this is the drive line here, and that's the drive line dressing. 
and there's usually, you can't see it, but there's an anchor here that helps to secure the drive line too. They usually have a little bit of an extra loop to make sure that um, if for some reason it pulls, it's not going to pull a lot. And then the bag, the bag will have a waist strap and a body strap. Both straps need to be used, again, so that the, the bag doesn't swing away from the body or fall down from the body um, and cause drive line injury. Then we move to the hardware. The hardware was in trials a couple of years ago. Um, the patients have to at least be listed and active as bridge to transplant. It is a smaller pump, so usually it's going to be used with someone like a smaller patient, um, say a small female, 100, 120 pounds, something like that. Big, tall guys, two or 300 pounds, big BMI, um, six, seven foot tall, they're not going to be able to use the hardware. It won't pump blood sufficiently for them. Um, with this bag, this is the bag for the hardware that patients have when they first come out of surgery. There is a more patient-friendly bag that they go home with. Um, this one's kind of big and bulky. It has a Velcro strap that goes around the waist and then Velcros to the body. There's three clips you clip to that to make sure it doesn't fall. Um, and then there are, moving again on David, there's Velcro here that you can open up so that you can get into the bag to, to change the batteries. All of the bags, when they're in the hospital, they have the monitor, the display. Patients don't go home with that display. So sometimes it confuses patients when we start talking to them about how to change some of the wires and the displays. If it's really, really, really confusing, we just ignore it um, for those patients. So here's the hardware controller and your cords there. You see the top left is the, the blue tab holder. Um, that's the monitor connection. That's what is used to hook to the display and to send the information to the display in the hospital. Um, when patients are home, there's a little red pacifier, um, is what it's called, that they stick there. Um, and they, they call it, you pacify the baby as far as making um, it attached so that whenever you unhook your wires, it doesn't necessarily alarm unless there's a real reason to alarm. Um, the bottom two connections, number two and number four are your power connections. Those could both be battery connections or it could be one battery and one wall connection with the hardware. The number three connection is your driveline connection. So we are never going to teach patients to undo that. Um, the VAD team will teach them if they have to have a controller change, how to change the controller if there's a controller fault and a controller malfunction. But PTOT, we don't have anything to do with teaching that information except to tell them not to pull it out unless they absolutely have to for the bad team. Now you see on the monitor there, there's a number one and a battery cell that doesn't have any um, light slit. Number two, there is a battery cell that has a green light slit. Number two is, is obviously to battery. Number one is to wall. And because the number one is lit up, it's draining from that power source first. So the wall power is powering the bad right now. When you switch to battery, when you unhook the disconnection for the wall, um, the number two will get lit up on battery, and then it will drain power from um, the number two battery first. Just so if you wanted to tell patients what's being powered. Um, so as far as the role of PT and OT for bad patients, like we talked about in our frailty testing, um, we are doing frailty testing for workup. At the time of the workup, we're doing pre-bad education as far as sternal precautions, activity expectations, and what exercises patients need to be doing um, beforehand to maintain their strength and their function. Um, PT and OT are consulted during the surgery, during implantation, so that we can start our post-surgical assessments as soon as possible. Um, the main, biggest role that we have is reinforcing bad power source and accessory management during mobility. Um, and again, it's that education, education, education is the big component here. Um, our OTs are consulted before discharge to teach showering, and they will talk to you about that um, in detail as far as the timing of that and whether it's a mock shower or a real shower and the procedure and protocol for that. We're also wanting to do frailty and functional testing before discharge. With the HeartMate 3s, they're still doing trials, so they will specifically call us the day of discharge for HeartMate 3 patients to ask for a six-minute walk test. So the big precautions that we have, just like anybody who has a sternotomy, six to eight week sternal precautions, we're teaching no pushing, no pulling, no lifting more than five to 10 pounds. 
They can and should use their arms overhead. It can be bilateral, it can be unilateral, to their tolerance mostly. Um, again, secure all parts, making sure that you use the waist strap and the body strap to prevent driveline damage and infection. It says no overly vigorous activity. We've had patients who have gone skydiving. It was a bridge to, uh, bridge to destination patient. He was heading towards the palliative route. So they've let them do a lot of things. There are people who go back to work as linemen, do chainsaws, all that sort of thing. So the VAG should allow somebody to be able, if it's destination, to live their life. That's the goal, hopefully. Um, we're going to monitor vital signs, and in particular, we want to make sure we monitor dyspnea skills and exertion skills. Some things to consider, the VADs aren't pulsatile, so your pulse isn't necessarily going to be accurate, your pulse oximetry readings aren't necessarily going to be accurate, and your blood pressure readings aren't necessarily going to be accurate. Um, if someone's symptomatic, we would want to make sure to let the nurse know, possibly let the VAT MCS coordinator, VAD coordinators know um, if it's a blood pressure issue. They have to get out the ultrasound of the Doppler, the Doppler to Doppler a blood pressure. Battery life, everybody wants to know battery life, and there have been numbers out there forever. We've got the golden numbers now. They vary depending on the device. HeartMate 2, 12 to 16 hours per pair. HeartMate 3, 16 to 21 hours per pair. And the hardware is 8 to, tw 8 to 12 hours per pair. Um, we teach the patients to always check the battery before they um, switch. Hopefully they have a full battery whenever they switch to, to battery. Um, the big thing, only disconnect one side at a time. It's specifically important for the hardware. The HeartMate 2s have an internal battery that the controller will keep running, uh, the pump will keep running for 15, 20 minutes. The hardware does not have an internal battery. So we just need to be in, um, careful and make sure that we always practice only disconnect and change one power source at a time. Alarms will sound whenever you disconnect a power source. Um, battery lifespan, lifespans typically are up to three years. We don't teach patients to completely drain the battery. They shouldn't be in that, in that habit. There have been some battery recalls for the hardware, so sometimes the batteries might not be accurate as far as um, showing how much is left. I'm not going to go in detail about all the alarms, but if you just want to know, there are red alarms, there are yellow alarms. Obviously, a red alarm um, is an emergency. Um, Usually, like we said, on the hardware, it's going to tell you what to do. There's usually two lines of text. One line tells you what the alarm is for. The other line tells you what to do about it, and it will say call, call team, call bad, bad, bad team. Um, red is a no power alarm, which basically means you just need to try to reconnect your power. Um, again, the medium yellow flashing, it tells you call bad team immediately. And a low solid yellow alarm is a uh, is, is again, the battery is nearing its life expectancy, so you need to change it, reconnect power sources. We're going to terminate session a lot like we would most of our patients if they have any signs of hypotension, intolerable dyspnea, any significant chest pain, extreme fatigue, or they request to stop. Um, we're going to give them a rest break if possible, but then go ahead and move on. Here's the big thing as far as terminating a session. If VAD flows drop below 2.5 liters per minute, and again, that's <coughs> essentially equivalent to your cardiac output, um, and there is a new CPR algorithm that we'll go over briefly, um, but basically that um, CPR <coughs> algorithm, the code rhythm, gets activated if flow is less than 2.5 liters per minute. If there's a drop in blood pressure more than 10 millimeters of mercury, but again, that's a little bit subjective because blood pressure is not always accurate. Most of the time with these patients, you're going to pay more attention to their signs and symptoms than to some of the numbers. Um, heart rate greater than 150. The big thing is sustained VTAC or ventricular fibrillation. Um, I had a guy maybe about two weeks ago. He was a little bit dizzy. His rhythm changed to sustain VTAC on the alarm, VFib on the alarm. He was talking. He was with it, whatever. They came in. They hooked him up to the um, code cart um, EKG and he was definitely in uh, VFib. So they got him stabilized, they switched him back over, but those are the big things to worry about. Um, patients should sleep on the, on the wall, on the wall power. They shouldn't sleep on their batteries just because they may not hear an alarm. It's a little bit better backup. Um, the patients too, typically, they go home with a cigarette lighter adapter 
as far as being able to charge whenever they're out and not fully drain their batteries whenever they're out, say driving from, if they have an appointment, doctor's appointment here in Lexington and they live in Pikeville, um, they can plug up in the car and not be draining their battery the whole time. Um, they usually also call the power company whenever someone goes home to bad, uh, with a bad and they make sure that their, their emergent flight is an emergency. So if, if they lose power during a storm, they're the first people that the power company tries to go back to and get their power restored as quickly as possible. They usually recommend they get generators too um, for that instance. Um, so as far as the ACLS part protocol, if the pump is off, when the pump's on, you can stick your head to their chest and you can hear a little hum. Um, if the pump is off more than 15 minutes, UK policy is not to restart the pump. Um, if it's off less than 15 minutes, they can try to restart the pump. But the risk is, if it's not been spinning for that long, is a clot forming and then sending the clot elsewhere. You'll hear the team talk about suction events. And so a suction event, the VAD will alarm. And basically what happens is that there's usually not enough volume for some reason. And when the vacuum, the pump is sucking blood, it can't suck enough blood. So it actually sucks on the septal wall and it can cause the right ventricle to dilate. It can cause right heart failure. So that can be a big thing. Um, a PI event, so the PI, we <coughs> talked about, it's the pulse fertility <coughs> index, that the heart, native heart, still pumps some, it still works some. Um, and basically the PI is a relationship between the native heart working and the pump working. Um, and a lot of these can be related to low volume or clot. They tell you if there's more than um, 10 PI events or suction events in an hour, the bad team wants to be notified. Um, and the suction event looks like on the, the blue monitor, it looks like vampire teeth. So it kind of um, almost looks like VTAC, but in reverse. Um, so we talk about the HeartMate 2, the HeartMate 3, and the HeartWare as far as different things. Um, the HeartMate 2, you'll see it looks different. It's a white controller. HeartMate 3 is navy. The big thing with the HeartMate 3, it has a longer drive line. It detaches, and the main reason for that is to help prevent drive line infection. Um, and if there's drive line fracture, they can change that without having to go in and do a whole pump exchange and do a surgical exchange. Let me talk about that. So ECMO, like we said, um, eCPR, they can use VA ECMO to do emergency CPR. So if somebody codes on the floor, they code in the cath lab for a long time. They'll bring them down to the unit, um, they'll put in cannulas, and then that can actually um, help to let the heart rest a little bit and recover. So with ECMO, we're working on gas exchange and perfusion. It can be assistance with lung, it can be assistance with heart, um, and we use it with all ages. And UK is triple certified, meaning that we do neonatal, pediatric, and adult. Um, you see there, just like the others, it can be used for bridge to recovery, bridge to device, bridge to transplant, bridge to decision. Um, several <coughs> different models, sedated versus awake and ambulatory. And we try to tell and stress to the ECMO team, um, a, ambulatory ECMO is not necessarily ambulatory. It's awake and doing exercises. Um, not all patients are appropriate for, for walking. Um, and this is one of our first patients that UK did as a bridge to transplant patient, that's Sid. Um, you see Tia on his right there, and he's in a standing frame. Um, we can use it just like with all the other devices to wean from, because of failure to wean from bypass, um, respiratory distress, ARDS, and your major goal is to prevent lung injury. The longer you're on a vent at high vent settings, the more likely you are to actually get um, lung injury. So to do walking ECMO, you have to have a cannula that allows for mobility that's not in the groin, it's not femoral. Um, the Avalon cannula was invented by a UK surgeon, and this is the Avalon cannula. Um, you see it in the heart there. And basically you have two cannulas that go into one. There's a non-permeable membrane that separates oxygenated from deoxygenated blood. The deoxygenated blood is pulled from the vena cava, goes out to the ECMO circuit, goes through the oxygenator, and then goes back to the body. And you see the little red arrow? That little hole, the oxygenated blood is directed into the right atrium, and then the blood just goes back through normal pulmonary circulation and through just normal systemic circulation. So we will say sometimes it's like lung bypass, but it doesn't technically bypass the lungs at all. It goes through pulmonary circulation. And the big reason that we want to do walking ECMO, just like everything else with therapy in the ICU, we want to prevent PICs, we want to prevent ICU weakness. 
Um, there's several different modes, VV, VA, VB is a lung assist, VA is a heart assist. If people are on VV ECMO for a long time, it can damage the right heart. Um, when that happens, they may add an extra cannula, cannula, an arterial cannula, and then you get these VVA, VAV hybrid models. Again, I like to see pictures of what things are doing. That's the way my brain works. So you've got the illustrations there of um, the inflow and outflow. And again, just some pictures here. We have an axillary cannula. We have a femoral cannula. Um, this is one of the circuits. The circuit's really light. Um, this is the cardio help. Um, they use it when they're doing ECMO transport now because they can pick it up and not have to push it on a cart. Um, this is an Avalon cannula. So the, one of the big things that you should look at when you go into a room with a patient on ECMO, if they're on oxygen, getting support for oxygenation is a color change. The more FiO2 that the circuit has, you should see a clear difference between color between the, the um, inflow and outflow cannula. So you see that right there, that there's a darker red and there's a lighter red. As a patient starts to be weaned and that FiO2 goes down more towards room air, 28, 21%, there'll be less of a color change. But if you walk in the room and somebody's on 100% and there's no color change, something's wrong with the circuit uh, somewhere, somehow. You see where the, the second picture um, on your right is the cannulas. The cannulas are stitched internally. They're also stitched outside of the body too. You'll usually see a stitch on the neck and a stitch on the face. Um, we want to check the stitches before we move anybody to make sure they're secure. This is a bivad circuit. Um, it's VA helping with the heart. If it has an oxygenator, it's ECMO. Um, if they take the oxygenator away, then it's just doing cardiac support, then it becomes a bivad, a ventricular assisted device. Um, and then you see this guy has the four cannulas coming out of his body. Um, they zip tie these cannulas now where they attach to make sure they don't come apart. And um, sometimes people who are cannulated centrally like this, they, we can do mobility with them. It, it's sometimes more comfortable with them to put a abdominal binder on because the cannula is kind of, they're heavy and they pull away and cause a lot of discomfort. That's the circuit. That's a hybrid cannula. This guy was a bridge to lung transplant. He has the Avalon cannula and then the return cannula. The cannula is going down, wrapping around its belly and going into his right arm. Um, if they have an axillary cannula, they, the team, the ECMO team, wants you to limit range of motion on that side to 9 degrees and not weight bear with that side either. <coughs> um, and the role of PTOT is just like with everything. We're doing prehabilitation, we're working on, working on aerobic activity to wean off ECMO or wean the ventilator, um, educating patient and family, we're helping to improve mobility for skin integrity, cognition, and everything that we do every day with all of our patients. And that was our youngest ECMO patient we've transplanted. I'm hoping you see this. This works. That's her year after transplant. Shaking her thing to uh, Taylor Swift. So, I think it's cute for you guys to see that. Um, basically, if you want to look at this later, just kind of an algorithm as far as by cannulation strategy, what they can do. All of our patients, if they're awake and can follow commands, they can do in-bed activity. Basically, if they are femorally cannulated, that's limitation as far as sitting edge of bed or getting up out of bed. You know, just like everybody, go and rehab is twice a day, out of bed as quick as possible. Right now, the team is trying to wean sedation over three days. Their goal is during daylight hours to wean by 50% day one, another 50% day two, another 50% day three, and then they're awake and hopefully we can start doing some type of active therapy. Um, Hasn't been super successful lately, but it's a goal. Um, several years ago, we had a lot of patients here for H1N1. Basically, in the literature, if patients are on the ventilator less than a week and they get put on ECMO, their chance of survival increases to 80%. And this is one of our patients that was a bridge to lung transplant walk-in. She's also VBA. You see the abdominal binder there helping to secure that extra um, central cannula. I won't talk about all this stuff, uh, but Eric is one of our good patients. He has a Facebook page. It's called Fighting Cystic Fibrosis. He has a lot of good videos about the whole process of cystic fibrosis needing to get listed for transplant and his journey pre-transplant, pre-ECMO, on ECMO, um, and after transplant. Is that his picture just that 
So that's him before he got listed, before he got married. This is him like the first two, three, four days that he was on ECMO. That's him about a year after transplant um, in uh, the Caribbean with his wife. And he's got videos, the big videos. He has his first ECMO walk, his first walk after transplant, his second walk after transplant, probably about six months after he went home running up the stairs because he had to crawl up the stairs when he went home. And then he has a new video up. He told his story at the um, Derby Eve Lung Gala um, two weeks ago. Um, and it was really good. So he, he does a good job. He's back to work now. Um, so it's, it, it, most of us know him and have seen him even in the children's hospital. So if you all look at if you haven't looked at it, look at it. It's good stuff. And then the Berlin Heart. I put this on here mostly because the children's hospital hopefully getting back into doing more heart stuff. Maybe one of these years you'll see a Berlin Heart. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but the Berlin Heart was approved um, to be used, um, and, it, and it's so funny to me, the 2010 New England Journal of Medical article, 90% of children implanted survived the transplant versus 60%, they called ECMO a conventional treatment. <laughs> I don't think so. Um, but they've done about 1,000 transplants utilizing the Berlin Heart as a, vi as a bridge. Approval from the FDA was in 2011. The main thing there is they might, be able to, might need an abdominal binder for securement. And these kids, supposedly, they can go off the unit into the floor. So, and now Ms. Catherine's gonna finish up. This is the Syncardia Total Artificial Heart. And we've got one patient um, on this right now. Um, in 2012, we had only four people um, that received this. So there's internal and external components. Um, and there's a drive line similar to the LVAD, but also very different. And then there are a couple different drivers. So you would need to go on the total artificial heart if you have biventricular heart failure. And so that's a reason that you can't go onto the LVAD because that's only supporting your left ventricle. Um, so biventricular heart failure, um, if they're failed LVAD or transplant, usually if your left ventricle is failing, um, your right ventricle is not going to be too far behind. So if they can't do the LVAD, you might need to be on this transplant. And then if you are imminently at risk for dying of heart failure. Um, this is always a bridge to transplant. You're not going to get a, get a total artificial heart and stay on it the rest of your life. Um, there's an 85% chance of survival waiting for your donor heart. The only reason that this may not work is if you are very, very small, and that's the, the contraindication right there, if your uh, di chest diameter is too small, less than 10 centimeters. So um, what it does, and I've got a couple more slides um, to go in more detail, but you, your ventricles, both ventricles are taken away, as are all of your valves, and these artificial ventricles are attached. Um, so here's what happens. They transect your aorta and pulmonary artery. Um, your entire native heart, except for both atria, is removed. And there are connectors that go onto your, um, your aorta, or I mean your atrium. And then they take <coughs> these grafts and make the anastomosis to the pulmonary arteries and, well, pulmonary artery and aorta. And then the left ventricle is connected to the atria. And then you have um, the ventricles placed. There is Velcro that connects the two ventricles together for easier manipulation by the surgeon um, to position it the way that he wants. And then what is also interesting is that because you are going to end up with a heart transplant, they need to keep that space open. And so they put a breast implant down there to keep the cavity open and keep it from, from scarring down. So coming off of these ventricles, you have your uh, right and your left drive lines. Pausing. Okay, so the total artificial heart doesn't do anything to change the blood flow like ECMO would or a, a bad would. So everything's still the same. Right atrium to right ventricle, out to the lungs, back 
and then ventricle after the aorta. So that's what it looks like. That is the um, drive lines or the cannulas entering um, our patient's uh, abdomen. Um, right or the uh, right ventricle is attached to the blue cannula, and the left is to the red. These are the three different uh, kind of external components that you can have. Your companion two is what you're going to see um, in house when the patient is fresh out of um, <coughs> surgery. We don't have the C2 driver here. Um, we haven't used it yet at UK, well, at least for this admission um, for, the, for 2016, 17. And then you have the freedom driver. And the freedom driver is when they are stable, they can go to the floor, and they can even go home if that is what the team has decided. There's also a shoulder bag that allows them to put the freedom driver in it so for ease of carrying it around. So what happens is that the driver has two air compressors in it, and the air compressors are connected to those driver lines or the cannulas that go up into the patient's abdomen. And <coughs> when inside, let me look at the picture. Inside, there are these diaphragms right here, okay? And these are four-layer polyurethane diaphragms a pulse of air goes from the compressors inside the um, C2 driver through those cannulas and into the uh, diaphragms and that is what causes your the pumping mechanism basically. So when the patient is sitting in his room laying in bed we use the hospital air and then secondary air sources in the compressors when we go walking. <coughs> So in order to, um, so first to fill it, like I said, the air gets pushed into this diaphragm, the diaphragm expands, pushes the blood out, and then it, there is a vacuum basically in the compressor that sucks down and pulls the diaphragm back down to allow filling. So here are the um, hoses for the wall air, the hospital air. There's the cannulas that go up into the artificial heart. Here's us walking. Um, it, this is the drive line right here, uh, the C2 driver with the air compressors, and then our protocol right now is to have the uh, MCS coordinator or the nurse walk with us and pull the um, C2 driver. Um, his wife happens to be very ambitious and very knowledgeable and she um, insisted multiple times on pushing the or pulling the C2 driver and nobody was comfortable with that so it is now an official policy. <laughs> Disconnecting the air. Right, yeah, she wanted to do it all and she actually did not end up knowing more about it and what to do than some of the nurses who hadn't worked with him yet but still, no, it's nurse or MCS responsibility. So um, right now um, our patient is on the 70 cc total artificial heart and the big, if you take nothing else away, you need to know that this is only a partial fill and a full eject. So when the ventricle is filling it is only partial but then you have to get all the blood out. And so this is what you need to know. I'm not going to go into a whole lot of detail about how to read the waveforms and whatnot, um, but you do need to, if you are with the patient, you need to make sure that there is this little um, full eject flag. So there's full eject here at this line, and then you need to make sure that there's that little uptick there to, to show that all the blood is out. Here it is, the full eject flag right there. If there's no eject flag and it looks like that, then something is wrong. The nurse will be with you while they're on the C2 driver, but um, that's just a good thing for everybody to know. And so then the um, opposite is true too for the fill. Remember, it's only a partial fill. It's not meant to fully fill. And so the full fill is gonna be indicated by this drop to zero right here, and that's a problem. So this is the display screen on the C2 driver. Um, basically there's your alarms, battery, um, air, and then all of your cardiac output, rates, and whatnot. And like I said, you don't necessarily need to have all of this committed to memory because the nurse is going to be there with you. 
Okay, so then there's the freedom driver, and the freedom drivers, like I said, when they're able to go to the floor, they're stable, they can walk around on their own or with us, the nurse does not need to go with them. Um, and so this is the little backpack that he's got, same drive line um, going up into his abdomen. Again, uh, nurse does not need to be present. Um, you always have to bring the backup uh, freedom driver with you, and I have got that upstairs for the competencies that I'll show you. These people, they can go to the gym, outside, off the floor, um, and when they do leave the floor, you do need to have somebody with you. But otherwise, just to walk, just make sure you take the backup driver. So the freedom driver, these are just kind of the basic things to know. Um, these are your batteries right here. Um, this is the charge button. You push that, you'll see how much charge you have in the battery. If you need to change a battery, this is the release button. Just push it down. And to load it, honestly, you just shove it down until you hear a click. If you need to get it out, just push that release button. Um, so unlike the uh, C2 driver that has that big user interface and screen. This model is only going to show you your beats per minute, your fill volume, and your cardiac output. Um, so again, there's your uh, battery charge lined up. Um, each light is only about 20% uh, of charge, okay? And when all five lights are illuminated, that's going to be 81 to 100% of charge. So like I said, that's um, the only things that you're going to uh, uh, see there on the screen and then you've got three alarms the uh, battery alarm which is one for each side and then the temperature or the fault alarm we'll go through that here in a second so each alarm is going to have a visual and an audible alarm um, you do not ignore them they're all important they're all critical you can't mute them and so you need to find out what's wrong like I said, you might be on the floor walking with your patient. You might be the only one there when this happens. So that's why I put these in here. So a battery alarm, you're going to have a beeping audible alarm and a blinking yellow visual alarm. So um, if, if one, of the, one or both of the batteries has less than 35% remaining charge, and you need to replace each one, one at a time. You don't want to kill your patient one battery at a time and then once the charge is above 35%, then the alarm will stop. If it's incorrectly install, installed, if the battery is, then you need to make sure that you've pushed it down and locked it down into place. And if a battery is missing, you shouldn't have left the room in the first place, and you need to put a battery in. So then the temperature alarm, that's gonna be a beeping alarm as well with a blinking red light. And it may be too hot, it may be too cold, you need to figure it out and either make it cooler, warmer, whatever it wants. Uh, make sure that there is nothing blocking the filter, um, check the fan. At this point, the patient and the family do have training on how to change their own filter, how to change the fan. So um, this is something that they will hopefully have some knowledge of at that point. Now, a fault alarm is um, the most complicated because there's multiple things that could be going on. It's a constant alarm and it's solid red. So, they could be um, uh, experiencing, they could be doing a Valsalva maneuver, they might be coughing, they might be laughing, they might be vomiting, they might be having bowel movement, and they might be um, just straining because they have a heavy weight that they're using. So, you make them stop. Um, interrupt that. If their drive lines are kinked, um, straighten them out, unkink them. Um, one time I went in there and his drive lines were wrapped around each other and crisscrossed and I don't know how that happened but I immediately called the MCS coordinator to come and take care of that because that is just a um, recipe for kinking. So um, again, the driver is connected to external power with at least one uh, correctly inserted battery. Again, replace your batteries one at a time. And then once the battery um, is um, installed, then if it's low as it charges, it'll just go to a battery alarm. And then if the driver itself is malfunctioning, then you have to switch to the backup. Now you don't have to do that. That's going to be an MCS issue. 
So for us, all of this means that um, these patients are also expected to do early mobility, just like any VAD ECMO patient that we have. Um, these are some statistics by post-op day five, about 65% of all of our total heart patients were out of bed. Or syncardia, not ours. And then um, one week after implant, 75% um, of all total artificial heart patients were out of bed. Two weeks after, they were walking more than 100 feet. And then um, after two weeks, most of their other vital functions had returned to normal. So um, like I said earlier, in 2012, we had four recipients. Um, in 2016, last year, we had our fifth, and he's still here. Um, he's now in the Freedom Driver, and he's waiting for a transplant. Nationally, our youngest um, was nine years old, and the oldest was 76. The longest run has been 1,374 days. So things to consider, um, as with the VADs, you're not going to necessarily get good um, pulses, good oxygenation uh, readings, um, and blood pressure. And so the things you're going to have to look for most are your patient's constitutional symptoms. Pink, dry, and mentating. Um, a lot of their um, complaints are when you realize something might be wrong, um, you're probably good, it's probably going to be symptomatic. If, it hasn't, if the alarm hasn't started beeping. Um, so dyspnea scale and RPE scale are good ways to monitor your patient's condition. Obviously, you're gonna terminate your session if they faint or become <coughs> diaphoretic, dizziness, um, intolerable dyspnea, pain, fatigue, and, and this is subjective. Of course, they may wanna stop earlier than they should, so. Um, just some other facts is that um, uh, they're here. <laughs> you can read them. <laughs> um, like I said before, blood pressure, if you're not able to get one, that's not necessarily um, an a alarming thing. Um, the blood pressure is certainly not accurate for a total artificial heart patient. And, uh, that is very closely to ECMO. We're going to be working on activity tolerance, strengthening core stability. A lot of times we find that um, where they've had their surgery, they've got a sternotomy also, and so they're gonna have sternal precautions, but this also causes their um, core to be very weak. So that's one thing to work on. Um, their sternal precautions are the same as VAD, same as Angie said earlier. They can not push, pull, lift more than five pounds, but they can certainly raise their arms bilaterally above their head or unilaterally, unilaterally and they can certainly move them against resistance not more than five pounds. Um, like I said before, we can take them to the gym. We don't have all these things, but treadmill, they can go on the, in the gym and, and work. Um, and just general, general strengthening or stability. <coughs> so again, this is an early mobility patient population. We get them up and moving as early as possible. Um, I think Angie already talked about chest closure. Um, uh, so not only are we going to do gait training and whatnot, but um, all these people are going to have um, um, frailty tests done on them as well. So by the time they leave, they should be able to do transfers, ambulate, exercise program for bad, shower with their um, new uh, parameters. And like all of our patients, they should need to be doing as much as they can. They're supposed to go out after any MCS procedure and live a normal life to the best of their ability. And so if we can get them up and moving and walking either with us or mobility team after, um, you know, after we've cleared them from mobility team, um, try to get them walking five days a week. There's really no reason that they shouldn't. Any questions?